Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm Monica Pizzizzi. I'm a professor in the economics department at Stanford University. Well, thank you for joining uh, me on this podcast, Monica. And so to you listeners, Professor uh, Piazzesi and uh, Professor Amit Saru co-chaired a conference on uh, finance and environmental sustainability. And uh, Monica, you had some, some great papers. There were some interesting conversations there. Um, uh, what's your reaction to how the conference went? I thought it was a success so overall. A lot of PhD students attended and thought that uh, the, the set of topics that we covered were sort of insp inspiring them to write dissertations. Uh, there was a good discussion back and forth uh, between the participants, and Johannes Strubel gave a great keynote. Uh, so all in all, it was a great event. Well, that's great to hear. And of course, uh, Professor Strobel is uh, uh, one of the preeminent scholars in at the intersection of finance and environmental sustainability. Can you uh, maybe give us a sense of what uh, he talked about in his keynote address? His keynote covered roughly three topics. Uh, he first he talked about uh, what kinds of risk uh, climate change poses uh, in assets and how to measure those risks. So he talked, he distinguished between different types. For example, one is political risk. It's how policies that are uh, reacting to climate change might affect the production of farms or the success or profitability of farms, and thereby affect the returns on uh, assets that these farms issue, like stocks. How, how, the, how do uh, pol policy decisions affect um, stock returns? Another type of risk is just physical risk. Uh, so for example, to the extent that climate change affects the probability of extreme weather events, uh, those weather events might disrupt production uh, of farms, and that would also have an effect on their stock returns. So that's another type of risk. Another type of risk is transition risk, is how fast we get to uh, something like a net zero economy. Uh, and the risk, risks involved are going to um, affect farms differently. Some farms would benefit from getting to the to net zero faster and thereby have higher profits and higher stock returns, while other farms may uh, may not benefit from a fast transition. And so uh, the, all these risks uh, are risks that farms are exposed to, and that's why they show up in asset returns. Uh, and so one question is, how do you think about the measurement of these different types of risks? Uh, it's been very difficult to measure the risks because the sample has been quite uh, short. So finance does really well in measuring rate of returns when we have a long time series of data available. Uh, and with climate, really the many of the changes have only appeared more substantially in the data more recently, and so that's not the ideal environment uh, for research on climate finance. And so we, a lot of it has to do with uh, assessing uh, sort of the confidence with which we can make statements about uh, about these risks. So that was one of the topics he covered. That's super second... interesting. Let, let me ask you a question about that, Monica. So to folks like yourself who do research, in this area, it's really clear why we would want to be able to explicitly quantify risk. But for the for the listeners, for a general audience, why would why is it useful to be able to quantify risk? What does that allow? There are many different reasons why one would want to quantify risk. One has to do with just uh, 
investor uh, behavior and their uh, tolerance towards risk. So it's important to know, for example, whether by investing in an oil company, you are exposed to more or less risk than uh, if you were to invest, for example, in renewable energy. Uh, there are different types of risks that affect these uh, companies, uh, energy companies in both, both of my examples, and investors want to know which one is riskier. That's one uh, reason. So this is just from the investor's point of view, uh, how do we distinguish different assets? And so one of the distinctions is uh, how risky they are. The other is regulation. Uh, so for example, uh, the Federal Reserve is the ultimate regulator of uh, the banking system. And so the Federal Reserve has to take a, has to know how much risk is in the loan portfolio of banks? And the loan portfolio has two components. One of uh, the components is firm loans, uh, so loans to firms. And again, different firms will be exposed more or less to climate uh, risks. And the Fed, when it regulates banks, it has to say, uh, you have to be careful in your loan making. You can't be too risky. You can't make loans that are too risky. Why? Because uh, the, uh, the system has insured deposits, uh, so banks collect deposits from depositors, uh, and these deposits are insured, and so the Fed needs to make sure that the loan side of the bank uh, is not too risky. Another reason is that uh, if one of the banks uh, fails, typically there's contagions towards the other banks and the entire financial markets. Uh, we saw this in the uh, in the global financial crisis of 2007. Uh, so when a few banks fail, it's, it can affect the entire system. And so the Fed has to regulate these banks. And so one of its, its uh, tasks is to measure how risky the loan portfolio is. And that's where climate risks come in. It's one of the many types of risks that the loan portfolio is exposed to. And uh, much more interestingly, in recent uh, years, is the uh, risk in, uh, also um, embedded in the mortgage loan portfolio because a lot of properties uh, that are especially expensive are on the coasts and they are uh, particularly exposed to, uh, let's say, sea level rise. Uh, the risk of that, and so the again, the, the Federal Reserve, as the regulator, has to understand uh, whether banks uh, are recognizing the risks in these properties uh, and, um, and and behaving in a cautious way when they're making loan decisions. Okay, uh, so well, that is a second important role. Uh, well, Monica, that is super interesting. So you, I can imagine as uh, time passes and we see more and more of the impact from climate change, uh, if we had failed to properly measure these risks, it actually could some of the things you just talked about, for example, with uh, with the the crisis back in the global financial crisis and so forth, we could trigger uh, changes in the environment could actually trigger changes in uh, uh, potentially uh, very hazardous institutional repercussions if we didn't measure risk. So I see why I see why uh, uh, Professor Strobel was looking at that. And so I'd like now to bring in uh, my co-host uh, to the podcast, uh, Sophia Chin. And Sophia, uh, uh, tell the uh, listeners at home a little about yourself, and then uh, and I'll open it up to you. Okay, perfect. So yes, my name is Sophia, and I'm a sophomore at um, Stanford University studying in economics and um, math, but I have a particular interest in environmental economics. Um, so attending all of these conferences hosted by the GSB um, in partnership with uh, the sustainability department is super cool. And so for this conference, um, I remember hearing a talk about um, the carbon burden which was actually a new concept to me. And I, if I remember correctly, it kind of, um, uh, it means the present value of social costs of future carbon emissions. And so a question I have is, is carbon burden um, kind of like a growing concept that people are becoming more aware of? And um, like, what are some of the main sources um, to estimating carbon burden? 
That's a great question. So it, it's a relatively new concept to think about um, the uh, value of the carbon emissions uh, from firms. And so you can look at a particular firm, uh, let's pick uh, GM as an automaker. What are the emissions that GM is producing in its production? And so then the question becomes, which concept of emissions do you want to use? And the the paper used uh, scope one emissions. So these are direct emissions from uh, the use of fossil fuels. And so now that uh, you have an estimate of the total amount of emissions of the company, uh, so GM will report how many of scope one emissions they have per year. Uh, now you can apply a cost of, of uh, emissions per ton of emissions in dollars. So you have a, a, a value of these emissions. Uh, for society, uh, this, these are costs that these emissions entail. And so take your favorite cost number and um, value these emissions. And But now GM is a company that is has a very long horizon. It's going to produce many, many years into the future. And so what we're interested in is the present value of the costs that arise from all these future emissions. And so we need to compute uh, very much like the present value of an asset that pays out per year a certain dollar amount. Here we have per year a dollar amount of costs that happens and just because of these emissions. And then uh, the task is to compute the present value. And you can do that for each individual firm. Uh, and that's why the, the concept of the emission becomes very important, because if you do it for every firm and you want to add up all these uh, costs of this, the, 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 the burden, the carbon burden, if you want to, this to be addable, uh, you have to use scope one emissions. Uh, if you're using another concept, for example, scope two, which also includes the emissions of electricity production, uh, of electricity that GM, in my example, uses, uh, then you would be double counting because you're now counting uh, first the direct emissions that GM has uh, in, its, in its use of fossil fuels, but now you're also including the emissions uh, produced through electricity production. That's the electricity company's uh, scope one emissions. So you. So the, the right way to do this, and that was part of the discussion at the conference, is how to exactly do this correctly. And so we all agreed at the end, uh, the scope one emissions is the right concept to do this, to avoid double counting of emissions of, of different companies. Uh, and then you can actually compute an aggregate concept of, uh, these, of this carbon burden uh, for the entire U.S. economy. And of course, uh, you could go on and also do this globally for other countries and compute for the globe uh, the total emissions. Um, so it's an interesting concept to have in order to talk about the costs that are associated with these emissions. Okay, well, that's super interesting. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Monica, for, for coming on to our podcast. Thank you, Sophia, uh, for being my co-host. And thank you to all you listeners from Stanford University. Until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.